Those of you who know me know that I'm passionate about transparency in the software supply chain. Our next speaker is Dimitri Berioza, who's going to be talking about how you don't just have to rely on open source software to learn what the heck's in a piece of software. That with just a little bit of special skills in reverse engineering, you can learn that all software is in fact open source. Now, of course, we don't necessarily endorse this particular position, but he's going to give you some of the tools to think about that. Uh, Dimitri is the senior security researcher at Vector AI, and he's going to give you some excellent insights into how to open up the black box of commercial software to figure out what's in there and thinking about discovering vulnerabilities and ideally fixing them. Take it away, Dimitri. All right. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's great to be here. The reason that I prepared this presentation is that I have um, some friends in cybersecurity that consider uh, reverse engineering to be kind of hard to get into, kind of cryptic. So uh, my hope is after seeing this presentation, it will become a little more accessible, a little easier to understand and actually enjoy. So my name is uh, Dmitry Berioza. I'm a security researcher with uh, Vectra AI. We do on-prem and uh, cloud threat hunting using AI and um, uh, machine learning. Before that, I spent some time as a pen tester and um, secure software development advocate with IBM, X-Force ethical hacking team. And before that, spent a lot of years uh, doing software design and development. As you m may have guessed, uh, reverse engineering is one of my interests. And I, I live in Ottawa, Canada. Originally, I'm from Russia. So if you have any uh, Russian hacker jokes, please send them my way. All right, so let's jump right into it. So I'm gonna talk about what reverse engineering is and what the modern applications of that are, uh, what you can actually reverse and wh why do it. There are certain legal issues associated with it. I'll touch on that. There are different categories of reverse engineering that I'll describe and some code examples to kind of get you started, to give you a taste of, the, of what uh, you're getting into. There are a lot of tools that are available and I'll, I'll lightly touch on those. There are a lot of obstacles as you're doing reverse engineering and um, I'll give um, a brief description of that. And I'll present sort of like a self-learning plan for how, how do you actually start and how do you start, start practicing these new skills. And uh, we'll wrap up with general strategies and uh, resources. So what is reverse engineering? It's, it's basically a process of understanding of how, how some device or system or piece of software works just by examining it. And uh, in may, many times it's necessary because the original design is either not available or actually intentionally withheld. Well, when you're dealing with commercial software, that's very often the case. And if you think about it, humans have really been doing reverse engineering forever. So let's say uh, some primitive tribe discovered fire or dis discovered a wheel. Uh, they use that knowledge, but others also observe them and probably want to copy those inventions. And sometimes it's a kind of an adversarial exercise because people sometimes don't want to share this new invention that they have. And you, ha you kind of have to guess and try to understand what, what that invention is and how it works in order to replicate it. So throughout human history, uh, we see lots of examples of people actually doing reverse engineering just to, to copy new inventions. If you think about it, all natural sciences are essentially reverse engineering. Na nature doesn't come with a manual. You have to very slowly, painstakingly d uh, discover its laws. And what's, that's what scientists are doing. They're, they're observing, they're making experiments, they're documenting their findings, and then they're repeating the cycle again and again and again. And that's how slowly we discover laws of nature. And that's very similar to what reverse engineers do when they're looking, let's say, at a piece of software. And even if you haven't done reverse engineering yourself before, you, you actually probably have done it. You just didn't think of it as doing reverse engineering. When you were, you were a child, you most likely pulled apart some toy that you wanted to know how it works, 
or maybe you wanted to fix something around the house, some appliance that stopped working, but you didn't have the manual, you didn't have the blueprints, you, you just opened it up and tried to fix it. And it's probably haven't, haven't always been successful, but it's uh, always an interesting exercise. There are a lot of modern uses for reverse engineering. Um, the first one that comes to mind is, is security and vulnerability research because we're, we're in the security field, so that, that kind of seems obvious. A lot of researchers are looking at all kinds of, piece of pieces of software and hardware and trying to dis discover vulnerabilities. Uh, penetration testing. In, in my uh, penetration testing job, very often there were situations where th the customer we were doing penetration testing for wasn't willing to share the design of the product that we're testing. So we had to resort to actually opening it up and seeing how it works and uh, discover bugs that way. So it's, uh, it's a useful skill in that area. Malware analysis, that kind of goes without saying. Malware analysis is all about reverse engineering malicious code. But even beyond security, there are all kinds of applications in the world around us. Uh, military and intelligence work, that's uh, kind of goes without saying. C uh, countries constantly look at what uh, the the militaries of uh, militaries and industrial complexes of other countries are producing at new arms, new weapons, and they're trying to figure out how they work, maybe replicate some of those successes. So it's uh, it's a very active field in the military and intelligence. Scientific research uh, uh, deals uh, with some of that. In commercial research um, and competitive research, this is often done to either discover what your competitors are doing. So one car company may buy another another car company's uh, new model and pull it apart and discover what, what's inside and how they solved a particular technical issue in order to either replicate it or just get no, new ideas for building new, new models. Or sometimes uh, companies do reverse engineering just to, to uh, build compatible products. So you can see, you can often see let's say printer toner cartridges available for sale that are not made by uh, original manufacturers and this is probably a result of reverse engineering so somebody took an hp or a canon cartridge opened, opened it up figured out how it works and built a compatible version there are companies that are doing independent quality control and for that they have to open commercial products examine them maybe find weaknesses and report on those there is an interesting field where companies, there are companies that actually specialize on patent um, infringement detection. They examine, let's say, circuit boards or, or software in order to look for algorithms or certain designs that were actually patented by their clients in order to help with litigation so that one company can um, sue another company for stealing their, their patents and their inventions. So. And these are just a few examples. I'm sure there are many more out there. In this presentation, we'll talk about software reverse engineering, but that kind of includes hardware too, because much of modern hardware is actually driven by software. So why should you do reverse engineering? A lot of software and hardware around us are black boxes, essentially. Documentation, architecture, blueprints are either not available just because company didn't, didn't care, uh, to share them or their, their commercial secrets. They're withheld uh, intentionally. But we still want to be able to look inside those black boxes. We sometimes want to analyze products for safety or, or quality. We want to, if you're a security researcher, you want to look inside for either dangerous bugs that you want to highlight for that company or look for maybe hidden backdoors, which we still have, uh, still happens. Uh, companies do build uh, backdoors for their own technical support that's later abused by attackers. Sometimes company goes out of business, so there's no way to uh, discover uh, an architecture of a particular product. So you're forced to open it and, um, and, and examine it and, and learn how a product works in order, let's say, to fix it. Sometimes you want to build compatible products and the company that you want to have compatibility with is not forthcoming with their designs. They, they don't want to breed competition. They, they don't want to share their designs with you and you kind of have to reverse engineer that yourself. 
yet another reason is maybe you want to modify how the product works and f or or fix a certain annoying issue that the company is just unwilling to do again you, you need reverse engineering for that and it, it gives you that power to open a black box and actually understand what's inside there's this quote that i really like that when you know assembly all software is open source and, and I, I think that's very true uh once you gain some skills in this area all of a sudden all these things that surround you become uh kind of uh, it, it becomes possible to analyze them and understand how they work and maybe modify them which is um, a great feeling if you're in information security I would argue that these days it's, it's a sort of a required skill to know some reverse engineering techniques why first of all there's vulnerability analysis all these bugs that we see reported uh, practically every day most of them required some reverse engineering in order to understand what the vulnerability is how to trigger it so, so it just makes sense that you, you need that skill pen testing already uh, mentioned that it's, it's a valuable skill if you're testing uh, companies uh, products for for holes incident response is a very active area and those professionals constantly get samples of ransomware malware phishing emails with uh, some embedding executables and scripting they may analyze command and control instances remote shells there's all these malicious code floating around that you want to understand how it works to maybe in the hopes of discovering a kill switch for example and that requires reverse engineering but last and not least it can be a lot of fun really uh, it gives you a sense of discovery accomplishment you overcome challenges you look for secrets so you'll if you're into maybe putting together puzzles solving crosswords geocaching those kinds of activities you'll probably actually enjoy it and that's that's the goal really i think i firmly believe that you have to enjoy what you do for for a living so what can you reverse really pretty much anything so just just a few examples all executables that that, that you see on windows mac os linux uh uh, th that are compiled into native code also executables that are compiled into portable code such as uh, java.net python <clears throat> ios and android apps uh, javascript drives many of the uh, websites today and, and not only that and it's often minified obfuscated so having uh, that skill is important to understand how javascript and uh, web assembly applications work in malware you often see obfuscated powershell scripts so reverse engineering skills would be very useful in analyzing of those instances there's obfuscated office um, uh, uh, scripting that uh, you you may want to open up and, and figure out how it works there are compiled automation scripts bias and bootloaders shell code hardware firmware the list just goes on and on and on pretty much anything is reversible so before we proceed there is all uh, sometimes concern about legality of uh, reverse engineering and a big caveat i'm not a lawyer i don't even play one on tv this is not legal advice but this is what i, I could gather by uh, reading what's what's available out there so whether reverse engineering is legal really depends on the situation and i'll elaborate more a little later when you look at the license at the license agreements of most commercial products these days many of them contain anti-reverse engineering clauses so you will see um here's here's example for apple ios and for windows 10 uh they specifically ask you to not reverse engineer their products and it's, it kind of makes sense they don't want to reveal their intellectual intellectual property sometimes they maybe don't want flaws to be discovered and for them to be embarrassed so so i i can understand that um, and there there are existing laws that actually restrict reverse engineering so there's dmca you, you may be familiar with that there's computer fraud and abuse act copyright law there are certain uh european union directives and and there are others so th there's certain things to to uh, keep in mind when you're embarking on your reverse engineering journey is that you have more protection if you actually own the device or software that you're reversing if you got a copy from someone and you uh, let's say a, a piece of commercial software and you're pulling it apart and you later on publish your results uh you'll be uh, i would say in more jeopardy 
than if you were to actually legally purchase that software and open it up and, and analyze it. So um, keep that in mind. There is something called fair use defense in corporate law and using copyright works for good faith security research is likely fair use but again that's you, you would need lawyers um, assessment to, to, to be certain but that's that that's what um, general feeling is under DMCA a legal owner of the program may reverse engineer it and maybe circumvent, circumvent protections to achieve inter interoperability with other products so that's another case where it's sort of legal to, to do reverse engineering and like many things in life intent and what you actually do with the information that you discover is key. As I said, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, there's lots of information on the internet. There is a very good review published by Harvard Law School and IFF. Uh, and here's the link. By, by the way, uh, the, I believe the slides will be shared later so you can, you don't have to take screenshots or something. So for my own work, I just kind of use this um, uh, rough split of reverse engineering activities into three categories the way the way i see them and again this is not legal advice things that i believe are safe to do is first of all anything that you produce yourself you're you're free to then reverse engineer so let's say you write a program and then uh disassemble it decompile it that's you're completely uh free to do that and also non-commercial software i believe is is fair game if you are looking at commercial products but do that in private do not share uh, your findings you're doing it just for learning just just to understand how things work but do not publish your results do not take advantage of uh, results in any way i think that's that's a pretty safe uh, activity and of course malware analysis um, malware authors will not go after you if you uh, reverse their um, malicious code the second category is where you actually have to kind of go more carefully if you're doing reverse engineering of commercial products for security research, there, there are gray areas there. Bounty programs do offer some protection. I think there's explicit clauses there that say that, you know, if, if we want you to test our products for security, we do allow a certain degree of reverse engineering. And you have to be careful when you, when you publish maybe portions of reversed code as part of um, responsible disclosure publishing tools that are built on the knowledge that you discovered through reverse engineering you kind of have to tread carefully because there were legal cases in the past and uh, so there was a case of circumventing uh, dvd copy protection circumventing adobe protections charges were were, were dropped people were acquitted but th that doesn't mean that's going to happen in every case so you really have to be careful and another thing to think of is that uh, company even if what you're doing is completely legal it's kind of in the eye of the beholder and the company may take offense at, at you reversing their product and they legally may legally harass you you know send cease and desist letters and uh, you know cause all kinds of legal trouble for you even though you may be uh, within your rights of doing this and th they probably have deeper pockets than you so it's it's something that uh I think most of us wouldn't wouldn't want to uh, to happen to them. And then final category is uh, things that are really really dangerous. If you do a reverse, uh, if you reverse some product and just dump uh, fully uh, all the discovered proprietary information that you found, or what's even worse, you start profiting from it, or maybe you start building compatible or competing products, you have to seek legal advice because you know it's, when there there's money involved and um, use of somebody else's intellectual property for your financial gain that's uh, that's that's kind of dangerous you have to uh, ask for help in those cases so th there, there are several types of reverse engineering um, you can start with data and communications analysis and that that's useful when uh, something that you're looking for let's say a um, piece of software or or a device uh, where it's truly a black box you, you actually don't have access to the underlying uh, executable for example so you can still do some reverse engineering because you can monitor data data formats that are being produced you can uh, interact with the product dump different files that are being produced and kind of tease out the knowledge about what what those formats are and how data is exactly stored um, the same goes for analysis of network protocols and uh, it, it just requires just a lot of patience careful examination and just use of uh, 
uh, network capture tools and binary editors. Disassembly is, is, is kind of the next step is where you actually have the executable code you can look at. And uh, so, so you basically take the compiled binary and convert it in, into human readable machine instructions. And uh, that can be done for native code and the portable code, such as um, what, what JVM produces, for example. And finally, there is the compilation. There, there are a bunch of tools that actually are smart enough to convert machine instructions into uh, something that's close to original uh, uh, source code. Uh, the results are spotty. Uh, most of the time, C-like pseudocode is, is, is recovered and uh, portable code is actually, actually higher level of, uh, uh, of uh, decompilation. It's, it's much, you get much better results with those. And I'll, I'll show you an example in a second. You can also do static analysis versus dynamic analysis. And static analysis involves just looking at the code and it's useful when you, you, let's say you don't have hardware or emulators available to run this particular piece of code or where debugging is not possible for whatever reason or anti-debugging measures are just too hard to, to overcome. And that's balanced with, by uh, dynamic analysis, which where you uh, do reverse engineering through execution and debugging. And it's, it helps in cases where code is really obfuscated, compressed, encrypted, and you kind of want to open it up without apply, you know, sitting with pen and paper and trying to analyze things. And, and they really uh, go hand in hand. The assemblers and uh, the compilers are often integrated with debuggers and the combination approach often works best. So let's look at a, a small example. So this is a tiny C uh, application just has an embedded password, which is a horrible uh, way to program. But anyway, uh, it just checks whether passwords that user entered on command line matches and exits. So pretty simple so far. If you were to open, if you compile it or not open it in a binary editor, you'll see this, which is looks, looks kind of intimidating when you look at something like that for the first time. And that, that's totally understandable. And I think that that's what stops a lot of pe a lot of people from actually proceeding because who, who can decipher this, this junk? Well, luckily there are tools that can actually can open that up for you and present it in a more human readable form. So that same application, after it was compiled, it's now opened in a, in a debugger and there, or, or disassembler that's embedded uh, in the debugger. And now you can actually see that it's not junk. It's actually a set of instructions. Maybe the syntax is not familiar to you, but you can sort of start to see meaning to this madness and uh, see different parts. They're doing different things. And the names maybe start to look significant and uh, easier to understand. So th this is a much better picture. You, you can actually see that it's not random. It's These are a set of machine instructions that are just correspond to that original piece of C code. And as you, as you arm yourself with an, let's say an instruction manual for that particular processor, you can look closer and you can actually see correspondence between different things that were in the original source code and what's being generated. So we have um, a constant there uh, that's uh, referenced. You have uh, some comparison operators. Uh, you see that uh, there's a, a setup uh, for a function call. There is a checking of a return results from a function. So things become a little more clear. It's not as scary anymore. Uh, once you employ the compiler, uh, sorry, the compiler, things get even better because uh, the compiler actually, as I said before, makes an attempt to recover the something close to the original source code. So this is the pr uh, result of uh, the compiler running over that application. As you can see, Yes, some things were lost, so comments, some symbolic names were lost, but the algorithm that's recovered is actually very close to what we originally had, and that's that's a big help. And if you look further uh, at uh, languages that compile into portable code, such as Java, you will see that picture is even better. Like, you, you get almost a one-to-one -one correspondence between what the compiler produces and what was the original Java code. You lose little things, you lose some descriptive comments, some descriptive variable, variable names, maybe sometimes um, function names, but things look much better now. And the compilers exist also for like, thing, things like um, .NET code generated 
for C sharp. So here's the C sharp example, and on the right is a decompiled representation. Again, almost a one to one correspondence, which um, uh, pretty encouraging. So what tools are available? So uh, IDA Pro is synonymous with reverse engineering, has been around for a long time, really an ultimate reverse engineering tool, has tons of support for many processors, environments, has a disassembler and a debugger and a decompiler add-on, so kind of has, has everything, has plugins, scripting, is a really mature tool at this point. The downside is that it's, it's kind of expensive, uh, two, four, two to four thousand dollars for a single architecture. So if you want to do, let's say, reversing on a 32B platform and then on 64B platform, you have to buy two copies. So that's, that's uh, not everyone can afford that. But luckily there, there are free versions that you can start with and there's a home version that's much less expensive for um, like professionals that are working on their own. Uh, Hydra is another famous tool open sourced by NSA of all organizations. Uh, many supported architectures. It's also fairly mature. I would say it's a little rough around the, the edges sometimes, especially the user interface, but there's tons of work going on on improving it. So that's great. And you can contribute to it. It's, it's, uh, it's on GitHub. It uh, has a disassembler, decompiler, and now has a debugger too with the latest version, which is pretty cool. And also has plugins, scripting, and so on. And the list of tools is really endless. Uh, there are complete fra frameworks like a Radaria or a Binary Ninja, uh, decompilers, there are uh, debuggers, there are uh, tools specifically for .NET, specifically for Java, specifically for Python, specifically for web app uh, assembly. So there's a full spectrum. And there are even spe uh, special virtual machines that you can download and run. Uh, one is Flare VM, I think it's published by FireEye. It's on Windows and Remnix is a Linux uh, VM that has already built in a lot of reverse engineering tools uh, and, and it just simplifies uh, things by having everything in one place. And really uh, sort of like a Kali is for pen testers or, or, or Parrot. And, and the list is endless. So um, don't be offended if I, if, I, if I didn't mention your favorite tool. So of course, not everything is as, as rosy or as, as easy as we saw in the previous slides. Uh, things are actually, as you do reverse engineering, things get pretty difficult. So first of all, as part of compilation and compiler optimization, code is made more difficult to reverse. So you lose code comments, meaningful names, you often lose structure of data, you lose objects uh, for object-oriented languages. So that uh, that makes it uh, kind of difficult. So uh, as part of reversing, you actually have to recover all of that through careful analysis in order to understand what's going on. Uh, variables move between stack and registers and that, that, that gets kind of confusing. Execution flow uh, gets obscured because of optimization. So your loops, uh, conditional statements, exception handling, code can be moved around a lot and decompilation may not, may not recover that cleanly. Plus there's function inlining, embedding of libraries that just explodes the body of code. So it uh, makes things hard. Then, of course, software publishers would not sit idly and let you discover their secrets. They're not happy about it. So they employ all kinds of uh, countermeasures to complicate analysis. And I'll just quickly go through just a, a laundry list of things. So first of all, there's obfuscation. They sometimes deliberately obfuscate names for, well, let's say, for scripting or P code languages. So it's, it's hard to understand the meaning of the code. Code gets modified for scripting languages. Uh, packers are uh, often uh, employed and that just compresses the code that gets de decompressed on the fly. Of course, that, that makes it harder to analyze. Encryption is popular. So code sometimes gets encrypted and decrypted at runtime. So again, you have to kind of reverse things dynamically, understand what's going on. And, and that could go down in multiple levels. There are anti-disassembly uh, methods that, that are being employed, such as uh, jumps into the middle of instruction or false branches, and it confuses dis uh, disassemblers. And there are deco anti decompilation methods, so ob 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 obscuring of program flow, useless dead code, extreme optimization. Some um, tools actually implement like a, a new VM and they com uh, come up with a new instruction set where they compile the original application into that instruction set and that VM, mini VM, is executing the application. So that, that can, things can get really, really obscure. 
there, as you start debugging, there are all kinds of anti-debugging tricks from debugger de de uh, detection, VM detection, and many others. And this is not the exhaustive list. So uh, this makes things very, uh, very difficult, but it's an arms race. Debuggers and, and VMs, they sometimes uh, uh, have measures for hiding their presence. The assemblers and the compilers, they get smarter over time and, and they can overcome some of these tricks. Uh, so the bottom line is expect these challenges in your reverse engineering work. They can all be overcome with adequate techniques and tools. And th there's really, my firm belief is there's nothing out there that cannot be analyzed and reversed. It's just a question of how much time and effort you're willing to invest. So uh, here's a rough plan I, I would propose if you want to start out. So first of all, uh, level zero is, uh, as with many things in life, the, the only way to get good at it is to study and practice. And I would say there are certain required skills before you begin. Um, it's not a, a really high bar for entry, but you have to have some knowledge. You have to have some beginner ability to write in a programming language. Um, C and C++ is an asset. Uh, basic knowledge of target computer architecture is a plus. You need to have a general idea of how compilers operate, how they take that original source code and produce machine code. Uh, you don't need to be an expert, but just some understanding is necessary. Uh, otherwise, you'll you'll just be looking at manuals all the time. You'll, uh, it, it'll, it'll, it'll be very slow going if you don't have some of that knowledge. And of course, attention to detail and, and patience. This is uh, 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 sort of uh, assumed. Then you can, once you, if you feel that you have that, you can start by doing do-it-yourself do code samples. And the, the reason I prevent, uh, propose that is so that uh, you, you can write really, really simple programs. You can write programs that try different uh, di different features of the programming language and then compile them and try them in different decompilers and different disassemblers. And that way you're starting slow, you're starting with very simple stuff and you're learning tools at the same time. So you, you don't go full hog on a really complex application. You start with really, um, really primitive code. And as part of that, you can also look at how compiler produces the code because there, it's not just the code that you put into the source code. There's uh, some setup and teardown uh, code that, that get added to the executable. There are function prologues, epilogues, there's library code. You can try debugging. So you start little by little. And the, the big advantage of this is that you take one of the variables out of the uh, uh, equation is that in, in the sense that you know exactly what the end result of your efforts will be because you wrote those little applications. And once you've, you've practice, practiced with that sufficiently, the next level is to do uh, crack me's as, they, as they're called. These are challenges designed, designed by someone else, typically fairly small applications they are hiding a secret called a flag and you can go at your own pace. So there are lots of crack me sites out there. The one that I like is called WeChal because it's sort of like a global directory of challenge sites. From that, you can go into many others. And there is a global scoreboard to gamify the experience, which is um, uh, always interesting. Once you've conquered that, the next level, I would say, is actually doing on CTFs online or in person uh, once the uh, pandemic subsides. <laughs> subsides. Um, so th there are competitions of all levels from beginner to pro. Uh, they occur all over the world fairly regularly and in almost every CTF you'll see reverse engineering challenges. Typically you have 40 out, 48 hours to do a particular competition but there are many uh, different uh, styles. Some, some are shorter, some are longer but that's kind of uh, the most common format. And the good thing about this is that you're no longer going at your own pace. There's certain time pressure added to the experience and that in my experience that puts learning in overdrive. And I, I recommend CTF time. It's a very known, very well known resource. It's a directory of all kinds of CTFs going on all over the globe. Pretty much every week, there's something going on that you, that you can just join and, uh, and play. And you don't have to be a pro to start. And there is, there is a global scoreboard. So they also try to gamify the experience a little bit to actually encourage you to, to do more and uh, to, to get better. Uh, and, and the ultimate level, I would say, is, is a competition called Flare On. Uh, it's created by FireEye um, every year. 
As far as I know, it's the toughest RE competition in the world, And uh, but I may be wrong. If, if I'm wrong, please let me know. If you know of something uh, better and, and more uh, more tough. They usually have about 12 challenges of increasing difficulty, and you get about 40 days to complete them. That seems It doesn't seem like a lot, but actually it is, because challenges get really tough towards the end. You'll, you can spend days and weeks on, on a particular challenge. And there is a huge variety of um, platforms for which you get the, these challenges, so you get to try a little bit of everything. And what's very interesting is many challenges are based on real malware samples, real malware techniques, so that, that will help you in your day job as well. And the finalists get, get a prize, so whoever reaches the end actually gets a prize. So that's, that's pretty awesome. So there, there are certain general reverse engineering strategies that I think are, are useful. First of all, uh, I, I mentioned that I, I firmly believe that you have to enjoy what you do. Making reverse engineering an enjoyable experience is, is key. Uh, it requires a lot of time, patience, you're digging in these details, you may as well enjoy it. Otherwise, you, you will dread it. Why do it otherwise? So make sure it's something that you're really motivated to do. Uh, maybe solving a puzzle, maybe you're playing in, a, in the competition, uh, maybe you're trying to discover a, um, a, secret, uh, a secret backdoor or try to find the bug. Get some motivation for doing it. It'll, it'll go much smoother. Reverse engineering is very, very complex, and, and modern applications are insanely complex. Even something as small as Windows Notepad get, has 13,000, roughly, uh, machine instructions. It's just, it's just mind-boggling. So it's just unrealistic to expect that you will take a random application and will quick, quickly, fully understand how it works. It just doesn't work that way. Even if you had a source code to any reasonably sized uh, modern application, that's fully commented. It will take you days and weeks to understand how it works. And now, now we're faced with something that doesn't have that that uh, source code, uh, no no documentation. So reversing something completely is just an unrealistic goal. So what I would suggest that you focus on is on the on a certain target that you're looking for. Maybe you're trying to discover a particular algorithm, or you're looking for a specific piece of data. So focus on that. Do not try to understand everything. Do not try to boil the ocean. Uh, so just focus on the prize and then slowly expand your understanding around that as necessary. Uh, I mentioned this before, combining static and dynamic analysis is, is important because they, they have their, their merits. Using a debugger for analysis uh, helps you a lot because uh, analyzing by hand is often too labor um, intensive. And you can make the application do the heavy lifting. So let's say there are all kinds of encryption, compression, obfuscation algorithms are employed. You can debug it in such a way that these algorithms actually get executed. So application opens it up, uh, it up uh, for you and lets you see the, 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 the decrypted, decompressed representation. So rather than you're doing it yourself with careful debugging and maybe jumping around with a debugger, you can actually achieve that. And, and that helps a lot. Um, and, uh, um, and you can make static uh, uh, analysis simpler by scripting some of the reversing work. So if you, let's say you discovered the compression algorithm, you can quickly script it, let's say in Python and apply it to the executable rather than doing everything by hand. And scripting in general, is great. It's built into most, um, well, not, maybe not most, but many to, um, reversing tools. So take advantage of that. And uh, it, it's, uh, it re really helps you automate tasks and makes it uh, uh, an easier experience uh, that, that you will enjoy. Looking for specific pieces of information that, that, that you want to discover is important, is also in a sense that there are things like magic numbers, for example, there are parts of specific algorithms, let's say specific encryption algorithms, you sometimes use magic numbers. So if you look for those pieces of information in the code, it helps you discover where that particular algorithm is located. And that those can be found in, in hashing or encryption. There are also certain system calls or lab, library functions that will tell you a lot about what a particular application is doing. So starting by looking for those can help you build a mental picture of 
what's actually going on. And there are, there are tools and plugins to help look for those. Documentation is very important because you're dealing with very complex activity. There's a lot of info that's lost in compilation. And as you slowly gain understanding of what different fields are, what different functions are, give them uh, meaningful names. And, and a lot of tools allow you to do that. Add a documentation as you go, add comments, uh, restore data structures. And you will see that as you do that, and you do that kind of in a re rinse and repeat fashion iteratively, you, you will uh, discover the, um, um, the, the overall understanding uh, uh, quickly, uh, much, much, much more quickly uh, 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 compared to if you just don't document anything, and just kind of tr try to stare at the code and, and understand what's doing, what it's doing. So there are lots of resources online to help you with reverse engineering. There are lots of blogs, uh, articles, Google it. There's a reverse engineering specific uh, conference that occurs in Montreal and Brussels, at least that happened before the pandemic. We'll see how things go in the future. And there, there are uh, discussion boards online. There is a specific reverse engineering discord. Um, uh, there is a, a Reddit section. There is a Stack Exchange area uh, where you can actually ask questions and experts can help you. So that's that's pretty useful. And there are also a lot of, uh, well, not a lot of, there's a certain number of books that are available. Uh, read those. And, and if you download slides, you can, you can uh, click on links there. So to wrap up, uh, as, as we've seen, a lot of software and hardware around us are black boxes and reverse engineering gives you that power to look inside and actually understand how they work and then do things with that knowledge. Maybe you can fix a problem uh, th that occurred or maybe you can discover uh, some hidden uh, bugs, hidden security issues or backdoors. So this is really a, a powerful uh, skill um, you, maybe you can build compatible solutions. Really, the, the sky is the limit. It's, it's uh, really like a superpower in a way. There are plenty of tools available to help you, to help you reverse pretty much any product out there. So, so seek them out and uh, experiment. And uh, as you learn more about it, I'm sure you will enjoy reverse engineering as a fun and, and really intellectually rewarding activity. Uh, that's it. And uh, well, thank you very much for listening. Uh, you can uh, connect with me on uh, Discord or Twitter or LinkedIn. And there's a link for slides. Thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you, Dimitri. That was that was a really interesting talk. And I think a great summary of how we can sort of dive into it. Um, you covered a lot of ground and, and touched on a lot of fun things. But I was wondering, could, you know, one of the fun things about InfoStack is the war stories. And I'm guessing that if we were in person, you'd have a lot of fun stories to tell over the bar. Uh, we're live in public now, so obviously there are going to be some things that you can't say. But is there, can you tell us about some interesting things you found uh, just to help us understand what are some of the values of, of developing some reverse engineering skills? Sure. Uh, so, um... I uh, pr actually primarily practice in things like competitions, uh, in solving offline challenges, because as you can understand, with the all kinds of legal restrictions, you have to be re really careful and not overstep the bounds and practice safely where you can. And that's what I would recommend to to everyone. And that's rewarding in itself, because you're, you're not just, uh, you know, doing this random exercise, you were actually striving towards a goal in a competition, you'll get a flag, you get your, you know, uh, team move ahead. So it's, it's really rewarding in, in and of itself, but it has real world value as well. As I mentioned that in, in my um, uh, pen testing job, we um, frequently had to analyze uh, code for which so source code was not available. So essentially we had to open up bi um, binaries and uh, see, see what's inside. And there were many instances where that paid off in spades uh, because um, in software engineering, even today, people tend to think that, you know, if, if I come up with this clever algorithm of maybe obfuscating this little bit of data, or maybe I'll, I'll hide a saved password here, but I'll encode it really well, 
nobody will will guess how to do that but you know we read in the news every day how uh, hackers uh, actually open up those defenses and find hidden secrets so i had many instances where i would uh, take an, an executable, open it up, and immediately stumble upon a password that happens to be hard-coded in either just base64 encoded, or maybe there was just a little more thought given to uh, to hiding it. But still, it's uh, for a really diligent attacker that that really knows his stuff. It's it's really no obstacle. Sometimes people will will try to do the right thing, and let's say oh. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we need to use this uh, internal certificate or a password, but we will encrypt it. But we'll encrypt it and we'll store the encryption key hard code, hard coded in the code right near oh, to where. Oh, how, how do you decrypt it, right? Uh, exactly. Your key's handy. Exactly, exactly. So uh, reverse engineering really helps with that because what. Um, as a developer, you, you sort of, and I used to be a developer, as I mentioned, for many years. You think that you know this is I, my source code. I compile it, and then it, this becomes this, you know, opaque uh, black box that you know nobody can look inside, and nobody knows what's inside once the application is compiled. And that's that's just not true. And for someone who deals deals with reverse engineering regularly, it's. Uh, Really, your application is essentially an open book to them. Anything you hard code inside, anything you encode or maybe encrypt by you keep the encryption keys around, that's trivial to open up. And I mentioned competitions, uh, challenges uh, like these where something is encoded inside uh, are just, uh, let's say, reverse engineering 101. Those are warm up challenges. In, in competitions, it's really so. It's, it's a lesson. It, I guess it's a lesson to be learned by those who build software. For those who are on the on the blue team side, when you spot these kinds of behaviors in your software engineering team, stop them because it's it's not secure. And qualified people will discover things like that. There was one example where we were given a compiled uh, executable. Uh, so that we could analyze, an, analyze uh, as part of an, a wider, bigger software package, we, we had to analyze for uh, for security. And uh, in there, uh, as I was uh, decompiling and, and looking through the code for interesting stuff, I found some interesting pattern where they would, uh, you know, take different uh, pieces of data and encode them and put them together, and. In the end, what I stumbled upon was essentially a backdoor that the manufacturer put in so that they could connect remotely to that piece of software. And in order to discover the key uh, for this backdoor, you just had to combine together uh, several pieces of publicly known information or maybe something that, that you could you could easily get from uh, social engineering. So that's a very dangerous thing and, and we highlighted it for the customer. Uh, but that's that's the stuff of that's the kind of stuff you discover through reverse engineering, and it's really rewarding when you stumble upon that because it gives you a sense of accomplishment. You you really found this hidden secret, and at the same time, you made the product more secure. I like that. And, and building on that, uh, just got a few minutes left, but I want to make sure. Uh, Barton Seal has a question in the Discord, uh, saying, you know, going back to this idea of uh, keeping your eye on the prize to help sort of yep. organize this. Do you have some recommended strategies for identifying what are the things we should be focused on? Is this something that you can have a checklist or it depends yep. too much on the software? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, uh, mostly I, I'm speaking from experience I gained through competitions and those are very specific challenges where, where somebody builds a ch challenge um, uh, that people have to solve as part of CTF. But when I approach a new executable that has, let's say, symbols removed, has you know things obfuscated, that's really, really hard to even understand where do you start. So the things that I look for are, uh, first of all, um, uh, there are system calls that are, uh, in, in the end, you, you invariably would probably have some kind of a system call that would either, let's say, uh, output something to the screen or write uh, write to a file. Uh, those are you could use as your anchors to kind of start pulling on things. Uh, printf statements, uh, maybe magic numbers. Uh, let's say in, in a lot of uh, encryption algorithms, hash al um, uh, calculation algorithms, there are certain uh, um, constants that are used. And if you, uh, let's say, you're looking at the sea of machine instructions and then you spot 
a um, a magic number, all of a sudden things come into focus and you see that, oh, actually this is not just, um, you know, uh, random code. This is actually part of this particular encryption algorithm. Let's look and see where it's called. And as you discover these little, little things, uh, system calls, uh, maybe known um, uh, pieces of, of um, uh, let's say, uh, a logic that's part of a, of a programming language that's part of a library that's compiled in um, uh, magic numbers. Once you, you anchor on those, then you kind of expand outwardly. It's very important to document things, to um, add comments, to name things with, with good, um, good names, so that building then on that knowledge, you can expand more and more and more. And, and sorry, well, one more thing, one more thing. In some tools like IDA, and I think Hydra has it, and then some other tools, they're actually, uh, uh, um, um, I forget the, the, the name, there's, a fu there's functionality that discovers uh, uh, standard pieces of code, standard library functionality in an executable. So you could run that functionality over your executable and it can, it can actually go and discover that, by the way, this f uh, function that's named, I don't know, ABC is actually a string compare function. And this function is actually an encryption algorithm. So they have that power to recognize some common code and give it uh, good symbolic names. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much. I think we are just about out of time for a Q&A. Uh, but it was mentioned in the comments that... Uh, this is probably one of the, the best uh, reverse engineering 101 talks that we've seen. Uh, a lot of people are going to be asking you for the, some of the links you shared. So hopefully the slides will be available, um, but perhaps you can chime in and sort of send people some pointers as well in the Discord. Absolutely. All right. Thank you again and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, some great talks coming up, but perhaps maybe it's time for a drink. <laughs>